Book 2, Chapter 2 With what nations the Romans had to contend, and how stubborn these were in defending their freedom. In subduing the countries round about them, and certain of the more distant provinces, nothing gave the Romans so much trouble as the love which, in those days, many nations bore to freedom, defending it with such obstinacy as could not have been overcome save by a surpassing valor. For we know by numberless instances what perils these nations were ready to face in their efforts to maintain or recover their freedom, and what vengeance they took against those who deprived them of it. We know, too, from history, what hurt a people or city suffers from servitude. And though, at the present day, there is but one province which can be said to contain within it free cities, we find that formerly these abounded everywhere. For we learn that in the ancient times of which I speak, from the mountains which divide Tuscany from Lombardy down to the extreme point of Italy, there dwelt numerous free nations, such as the Etruscans, the Romans, and the Samnites, besides many others in other parts of the peninsula. Nor do we ever read of there being any kings over them, except those who reigned in Rome, and Porcina, king of Etruria. How the line of this last-named prince came to be extinguished, history does not inform us. But it is clear that at the time when the Romans went to besiege Veii, Etruria was free, and so greatly rejoiced in her freedom, and so detested the regal name, that when the Veientines, who, for their defense, had created a king in Veii, sought aid from the Etruscans against Rome, these, after much deliberation, resolved to lend them no help while they continued to live under a king, judging it useless to defend a country given over to servitude by its inhabitants. It is easy to understand whence this love of liberty arises among nations, for we know by experience that states have never signally increased, either as to dominion or wealth, except where they have lived under a free government. And truly it is strange to think to what a pitch of greatness Athens came during the hundred years after she had freed herself from the despotism of Pisistratus, and far stranger to contemplate the marvelous growth which Rome made after freeing herself from her kings. The cause, however, is not far to seek since it is the well-being, not of individuals, but of the community which makes a state great. And, without question, this universal well-being is nowhere secured, save in a republic. For a republic will do whatsoever makes for its interest, and though its measures prove hurtful to this man or to that, there are so many whom they benefit, that these are able to carry them out, in spite of the resistance of the few whom they injure. But the contrary happens in the case of a prince, for, as a rule, what helps him hurts the state, and what helps the state hurts him, so that whenever a tyranny springs up in a city which has lived free, the least evil which can befall that city is to make no further progress, nor ever increase in power or wealth. But in most cases, if not in all, it will be its fate to go back. Or should there chance to arise in it some able tyrant who extends his dominions by his valor and skill in arms, the advantage which results is to himself only, and not to the state, since he can bestow no honors on those of the citizens over whom he tyrannizes, who have shown themselves good and valiant, lest afterwards he should have cause to fear them. Nor can he make those cities which he acquires subject or tributary to the city over which he rules, because to make this city powerful is not for his interest, which lies in keeping it so divided that each town and province may separately recognize him alone as its master. In this way, he only, and not his country, is the gainer by his conquest. And if anyone desire to have this view confirmed by numberless other proofs, let him look into Xenophon's treatise, De Tyrannidae. No wonder, then, that the nations of antiquity pursued tyrants with such relentless hatred, and so passionately loved freedom, that its very name was dear to them as was seen when Hieronymus, grandson of Hiero the Syracusan, was put to death in Syracuse. For when word of his death reached the army, which lay encamped not far off, at first it was greatly moved and eager to take up arms against the murderers. But on hearing the cry of liberty shouted in the streets of Syracuse, quieted at once by the name, it laid aside its resentment against those who had slain the tyrant and fell to consider how a free government might be provided for the city. Nor is it to be wondered at that the ancient nations took terrible vengeance on those who deprived them of their freedom, of which, though there be many instances, I mean only to cite one which happened in the city of Corsera at the time of the Peloponnesian War. 
for Greece, being divided into two factions, one of which sided with the Athenians, the other with the Spartans, it resulted that many of its cities were divided against themselves, some of the citizens seeking the friendship of Sparta and some of Athens. In the aforesaid city of Corsera, the nobles, getting the upper hand, deprived the commons of their freedom. These, however, recovering themselves with the help of the Athenians, laid hold of the entire body of the nobles and cast them into a prison large enough to contain them all, whence they brought them forth by eight or ten at a time, pretending that they were to be sent to different places into banishment, whereas, in fact, they put them to death with many circumstances of cruelty. Those who were left, learning what was going on, resolved to do their utmost to escape this ignominious death, and arming themselves with what weapons they could find, defended the door of their prison against all who sought to enter, till the people, hearing the tumult and rushing in haste to the prison, dragged down the roof and smothered the prisoners in the ruins. Many other horrible and atrocious cruelties, likewise perpetrated in Greece, show it to be true that a lost freedom is avenged with more ferocity than a threatened freedom is defended. When I consider whence it happened that the nations of antiquity were so much more zealous in their love of liberty than those of the present day, I am led to believe that it arose from the same cause which makes the present generation of men less vigorous and daring than those of ancient times, namely, the difference of the training of the present day from that of earlier ages, and this, again, arises from the different character of the religions then and now prevailing. For our religion, having revealed to us the truth and the true path, teaches us to make little account of worldly glory, whereas the Gentiles, greatly esteeming it, and placing therein their highest good, displayed a greater fierceness in their actions. This we may gather from many of their customs, beginning with their sacrificial rites, which were of much magnificence as compared with the simplicity of our worship, though that be not without a certain dignity of its own, refined rather than splendid, and far removed from any tincture of ferocity or violence. In the religious ceremonies of the ancients, neither pomp nor splendor were wanting, but to these was joined the ordinance of sacrifice, giving occasion to much bloodshed and cruelty, for in its celebration many beasts were slaughtered, and this being a cruel spectacle, imparted a cruel temper to the worshippers. Moreover, under the old religions, none obtained divine honors save those who were loaded with worldly glory, such as captains of armies and rulers of cities, whereas our religion glorifies men of a humble and contemplative rather than of an active life. Accordingly, while the highest good of the old religions consisted in magnanimity, bodily strength, and all those other qualities which make men brave, our religion places it in humility, lowliness, and contempt for the things of this world. Or, if it ever calls upon us to be brave, it is that we should be brave to suffer rather than to do. This manner of life, therefore, seems to have made the world feebler, and to have given it over as a prey to wicked men to deal with as they please, since the mass of mankind, in the hope of being received into paradise, think more how to bear injuries than how to avenge them. But should it seem that the world has grown effeminate and heaven laid aside her arms, this assuredly results from the baseness of those who have interpreted our religion to accord with indolence and ease rather than with valor. For were we to remember that religion permits the exaltation and defense of our country, we would see it to be our duty to love and honor it, and would strive to be able and ready to defend it. This training, therefore, and these most false interpretations, are the causes why, in the world of the present day, we no longer find the numerous commonwealths which were found of old, and in consequence, that we see not now among the nations that love of freedom which prevailed then though, at the same time, I am persuaded that one cause of this change has been that the Roman Empire, by its arms and power, put an end to all the free states and free institutions of antiquity. For although the power of Rome fell afterwards into decay, these states could never recover their strength or resume their former mode of government, save in a very few districts of the empire. But, be this as it may, certain it is that in every country of the world, even the least considerable, the Romans found a league of well-armed republics, most resolute in the defense of their freedom, whom it is clear they never could have subdued had they not been endowed with the rarest and most astonishing valor. To cite a single instance, I shall take the case of the Samnites, who, strange as it may now seem, 
were on the admission of Titus Livius himself, so powerful and so steadfast in arms, as to be able to withstand the Romans down to the consulship of Papirius Cursor, son to the first Papirius, a period of six and forty years, in spite of numerous defeats, the loss of many of their towns, and the great slaughter which overtook them everywhere throughout their country. And this is the more remarkable when we see that country, which once contained so many noble cities and supported so great a population, now almost uninhabited, and reflect that it formerly enjoyed a government and possessed resources, making its conquest impossible to less than Roman valor. There is no difficulty, therefore, in determining whence that ancient greatness and this modern decay have arisen, since they can be traced to the free life formerly prevailing and to the servitude which prevails now. For all countries and provinces which enjoy complete freedom make, as I have said, most rapid progress, because, from marriage being less restricted in these countries and more sought after, we find there a greater population, every man being disposed to beget as many children as he thinks he can rear, when he has no anxiety lest they should be deprived of their patrimony, and knows not only that they are born to freedom and not to slavery, but that they may rise by their merit to be the first men of their country. In such states, accordingly, we see wealth multiply, both that which comes from agriculture and that which comes from manufactures. For all love to gather riches and to add to their possessions when their enjoyment of them is not likely to be disturbed. And hence it happens that the citizens of such states vie with one another in whatever tends to promote public or private well-being, in both of which, consequently, there is a wonderful growth. But the contrary of all this takes place in those countries which live in servitude, and the more oppressive their servitude, the more they fall short of the good which all desire. And the hardest of all servitudes is that wherein one commonwealth is subjected to another. First, because it is more lasting, and there is less hope to escape from it. And, second, because every commonwealth seeks to add to its own strength by weakening and enfeebling all beside. A prince who gets the better of you will not treat you after this fashion, unless he be a barbarian like those eastern despots who lay countries waste and destroy the labors of civilization but if influenced by the ordinary promptings of humanity, will, as a rule, regard all his subject states with equal favor, and suffer them to pursue their usual employments, and retain almost all their ancient institutions, so that if they flourish not as free states might, they do not dwindle as states that are enslaved, by which I mean enslaved by a stranger, for of that other slavery, to which they may be reduced by one of their own citizens, I have already spoken. Whoever, therefore, shall well consider what has been said above, will not be astonished at the power possessed by the Samnites while they were still free, nor at the weakness into which they fell when they were subjugated, of which change in their fortunes Livius often reminds us, and particularly in connection with the war with Hannibal, where he relates that the Samnites, being ill-treated by a Roman legion quartered at Nola, sent legates to Hannibal to ask his aid, who, in laying their case before him, told him, that with their own soldiers and captains they had fought single-handed against the Romans for a hundred years, and had more than once withstood two consuls and two consular armies, but had now fallen so low that they were scarce able to defend themselves against one poor legion. 